listening. Welcome to the Fairways Show. My guest today is Kent Osborne, who's written a really interesting book called Play Like Ray. Uh, Ray's a leadership coach or, or a performance coach uh, by training, and uh, his book deals with uh, some insights and approaches to the game that uh, might uh, shake you off your normal foundations. Um, I'm not going to tell you any more about that. I'll, I'll let uh, Kent talk to uh, uh, how, he, how he got started in writing this book and, and uh, where it's leading. So Kent, uh, good morning. Good morning, Peter. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about uh, um, how the book started and, and uh, you know, what, uh, what motivated you to write it in the first place. Well, Ray, uh, the book Play Like Ray is kind of a combination of my uh, love for coaching. That's, that's my profession. And uh, my love of golf. And uh, really came about, I guess, in the most part, because I, I started playing golf at age 50. And I started playing golf with uh, the guys that I played softball with. And uh, when we played softball, we were, uh, we were a terrible team and we knew it. And uh, we used to gather together after every game and we'd give it a trophy uh, for the guy who made the worst play. The trophy was an artificial leg with a baseball shoe on it. And uh, there was no problem giving it out every week, believe me. But I started playing golf with the same guys. And what was interesting to me was this happy-go-lucky that we had on attitude that we had at the diamond. You get these guys in the golf course and they were constantly getting bent out of shape. Matter of fact, the better the, the, better the guy played, the more he got frustrated or annoyed when he happened to hit a bad shot, which was kind of the opposite of what was happening on the diamond. So I'm thinking to myself, look, uh, you know, I'm this, I'm this leadership coach and uh, I see these guys getting bent out of shape and that's not going to happen to me. I'm going to be poster boy for, uh, you know, just a good day at the, a bad day at the golf course is better than a good day at the office kind of thing. But lo and behold, uh, as I started getting a bit better and I could, I could break 100 and then I could break 90 and then on a good day, you know, I could break 80, um, I fell into the same trap. And the trap is basically that you, you ignore your best shots and you put a lot of emotional energy into your worst. So if someone, uh, you know, if I hit a great drive uh, and the boys said, oh, you know, nice drive, Kent. I'd be flatlined. I'd kind of go, yeah, sure. I mean, at some point I'm thinking, that's what I'm supposed to do, right? I'm a half decent club level player. I'm supposed to hit the ball in the middle of the fairway. And then if I made a bad shot, which, or missed an easy putt, which is going to happen every round, I'd, I'd get frustrated and angry like, like the rest of the guys. So it finally dawned on me one day that, that uh, man, I was in this trap and uh, I need to get out of it. And so the interesting thing was I, I, because of my background, I applied the, uh, the uh, sports psychology tools that I used to teach professional hockey players and that I would use with uh, corporate executives, you know, visualization, affirmation, relaxation, uh, positive belief. And that only made it worse for me. And thankfully, at the time, I, uh, through my work, I bumped into something called emotional intelligence, which really highlighted uh, the power of emotions and the, and, the, and the need to be able to manage or, or control your emotions from a, from a leadership and performance point of view. And I began to put together the, uh, the ideas that, were, uh, that are central to Ray, which is basically that uh, you know, my, golf is a physical, mental, and emotional game. And that the, you know, how I manage my emotions determines my experience on the golf course. Um, not how well I, not how well I play or how low my score is because relatively speaking, I'm never going to play that well. I mean, compared to what we see on TV. So uh, anyway, that's uh, kind of a version of how it all came about. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned in the book is that this approach is, is not really for PGA Tour professionals. It's for the average player who mm -hmm. uh, really struggles with, with this part of the game. Um, and, and you draw the comparison to somebody like Rory McIlroy. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, well, I think that the, if you're a professional 
you want to get into the peak performance zone. But from my perspective, uh, any recreational player who attempts to perform is making a mistake because we can't perform. I mean, in order to be a performer, you have to have world-class ability. You have to have the expertise and experience that allows you to be world-class. And we just don't have that. So it's fine for Rory and his, and, his, uh, and his colleagues to be looking to perform on the golf course. That's what they should do. But when you and I try, I mean, I don't know what handicap you play to, but I don't care if you're a low single digit player or, or a mid-level handicap. I mean, it's just, you're setting yourself up for suffering if you try to perform on a golf course. What we want to do is we want to get into something that I call the peak play zone, which means I'm carefree, I'm relaxed, I have the intention to hit a target, but I have no expectation around where that ball's going to go. Because truth of the matter is it could go anywhere. I have no control over the ball. I have no control over my swing. I mean, I, I can't, you know, make my golf club when I, my, my club head speed is, let's say with drivers, basically around hundred miles an hour. I've got no chance of controlling that so that it hits the sweet spot every time. No chance. So I don't know where the ball is going to go. So, but there's, so it's all about intention. It's all about focusing. Yes. Use your visual focus on, uh, on your target, pick your target and align yourself to your target, but allow yourself to relax into the idea that who knows where it's going to go. If, if you, I mean, everybody has a level that they play to and they also have a level that they, uh, aspire to, um, yeah. is, is the, I mean, do you still take performance or the term performance out of that? Because I mean, I, I I'm a, you know, probably a seven handicap, maybe the worst seven handicap on the planet. Uh, um, but seven uh, to seven. yeah, um, that that's, you know, what I score on my best days. So, um, when I go out to play, that's generally what I, expect to happen. I expect to perform at that level. Um, I know you used the term perform to be world-class and performing at Roy McElroy's level, but um, do, do other people have performance expectations too that you, you think are unreasonable or just uh, hamper their game, get in the way? Well, I, I, think, I think they hamper their game from my own experience and from what I've seen. Because even if you look at the handicap system, I mean, I don't know the numbers precisely, but you know, if, if you're a seven, that suggests that 20 to 25% of the time, you're going to shoot that 77, 78, 79 number. And the other 75% of the time, you're going to be north of that. Yeah. So if your expectation is, if I don't break 80, I've had a bad day. Three quarters of the time you play, you're not going to break 80. You're setting yourself up for you're setting yourself up for failure from my point of view. I mean, the, the bottom line is it's. I remember being with uh, a, a buddy of mine in Florida last winter. We went down to watch the Honda, and this guy is a um, a pro emeritus, uh, excellent player, excellent teaching pro. And I, I made some comment about uh, the fact that the guys on the range were all using TrackMan. I said, well, why are they all using TrackMan? And he said, well, that they want to know precisely how far their ball is carrying today in these conditions. And he looked at me and he said, it's not a hobby for these guys. And so, you know, it makes me go to the opposite, which is it is a hobby for me. But the problem is we, we tend to approach golf in the way that we approach our business or professional lives. And, uh, you know, my thing is I, I, I want to have fun and play well. I not, I don't want to have fun if I play well. Right. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. So what prompted you to write the book? Well, I'm retired from, uh, I'm mostly retired from my, uh, from my coaching career. I do a little bit, but, but not much. And, um, you know, I just, I just thought it would be a fun thing to do. Uh, there's a part of me that, that, that sees, I, I would say in the 14 years that I've been playing golf, 
I've played with a handful of guys that have had a scratch attitude. And I've probably played with, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of guys that, you know, either diminish their skill or sometimes even derail their rounds because they're of their emotional responses. So I kind of felt, you know what, um, it'll help me writing the book. <laughs> and, and if I can help a few other guys, then uh, that's great. So the, the two main characters in the book are, are Ray, who, who's uh, mm -hmm. like the, the guru and, and Bob, who um, I suppose is, is like you and um, the uh, um, guru takes him under his wing and, and shows him the, the, the way to enjoy the game and, and, and play better at the same time. So um, yeah. was there, was there a time um, maybe I shouldn't, I'm, I'm spoiling it, but Ray and Bob aren't real. They're, they're it's a, it's a fictional book. So, um, mm -hmm. but was there a, a time or, or an incident that led you to, or, or a light bulb went off in your head and, and, and all of this came, became clear and, and you sort of added this emotional aspect to the, uh, the whole approach to the game? Yeah, well, I, th I remember being on the range one day thinking to myself, man, you know, like because I fell into the same trap as anybody else, I, I got to the point where, you know, I was playing a lot of golf, but it was kind of like a grind. I mean, I wasn't, um, I, I wasn't enjoying myself. It became a test, like a pass-fail test. Uh, you know, as I was saying earlier, if, if I if I was able to shoot my quote unquote number, then uh, I was satisfied. But if I didn't shoot my number, I was I was sour. So uh, I remember one day on the range thinking that yeah, there's there's got to be a better way. And uh, you know, back in the day, I started before Ray came about. I actually started by uh, carrying this card around. I'll show you. It's kind of. Uh, I don't know if I've even got it right side up or upside okay. <laughs> down, but I sat down and thought about it. And it was like, I, I walked onto the golf course with these unconscious rules in my mind. And the rules were, you know, I must, uh, I must shoot my handicap or better to have a good day. Another rule is I should make every shot I could make. And no matter how well I play, I could have played better. I mean, how many times do you go into the clubhouse and say, hey, buddy, great round. The guy says, yeah, you know, but geez, if I hadn't doubled on number 16, it would have been. Exactly. I mean, it's, it's yeah. insidious. And I think, that the, I think that the PGA Tour, you know, I don't think they're consciously trying to do this, but I think that the way the tour is presented to us and the way most instructors are wired harms the average guy, in my opinion. Because we're, you know, we're watching the PGA Tour. I mean, when I watch Major League Baseball, I, I don't see the Conica Minolta Biz Hub Swing Vision camera showing me what, uh, you know, Barry Bonds is doing with his left wrist. Yeah, you know, and, and, if you, and if you listen to, um, and the other thing about the PGA Tour is we're watching, the, we're watching the best in the world when they're at their best on Saturday and Sunday. The other guys have been sent home. If you watch the tour on Thursday, you'll see a number of bad shots. Sure. You know, the odd time you'll see a shot that would make you and I cringe. But on Saturday or Sunday, when the best of the game are, are at their best, you know, the, the game looks easy. So, and you see that kind of mentality, that the performance mentality. I'd almost guarantee you, if you talk to any golf instructor, any golf coach, their language is peppered with performance. You know, I, I would love to see golf instruction shift from, from, from game improvement to game enrichment. Because the truth of the matter is, you and I aren't going to get better. We're just not. You're not going to get to a plus two any, any more than, uh, you know, any one of your buddies is going to suddenly be good enough to, to qualify for the Champions Tour. I mean, yeah, your handicap might come down a couple of strokes if you sharpen your short game or, or hit a few more fairways, and mine might go up or down a couple of groups. But fundamentally, we're not going to get to another level. And when you and instructors, they're, they're so wired to get people moving up the pyramid. 
you know, I mean, if look, if I had a if I had a twelve year old prodigy or twelve year old talented kid who's interested in golf, I'd absolutely hook them up with, you know, the best instructor I could find. But for you and I to go to, to you know, to get lessons with the idea that we're actually going to improve, I could set us up for failure. Well, it, golf's such an aspirational game. I mean, we we always want to improve. We're, we're always looking for the edge, the entire equipment industry is built on, you know, adding an extra five to 10 yards every year. If, if all of those were yeah. true, we'd all be hitting it over 300 yards, but, um, yeah. but you know, people believe it or, or, or perhaps are desperate enough to try it thinking that there's something out there that's going to make them play better. Um, yeah. So this, this striving to always improve, um, I, I guess it's, it's natural. Um, but as you mm-hmm. say, it, it's, um, it's destructive uh, in, in a sense because it's setting us up for um, unexpected results or, or yeah. you know, false expectations, whatever, disappointment, sure, all of those things. Yeah, one of the things I say in the book is it's, it's kind of like, you know, you, you, you bump into guys at your club and it's like, they're going to a, an expensive Italian restaurant three times a three times a week, every week of the year. And you say to them, why do you go? Well, I eat pizza every time I go, but pizza gives me indigestion. I mean, I go because the decor is great and the people are wonderful and you know, the appetizers are great, but the pizza, man, it makes me, it makes me feel terrible, but I keep going every week. Like it's kind of crazy when you think about it. The fact that we're paying to do this. Yeah. But I think the golf, you know, one of the things that you said is natural to be aspirational. Well, I've thought about, you know, why is golf not just so hard, but so frustrating? And I think in part is because of, of the nature of the game and the nature of the mind. Like the games that I grew up playing were hockey and baseball, and, and they are reactive games. I mean, I can be nervous, but we, we step on the ice and you give me a little elbow and, you know, the puck's coming my way and suddenly you're in the game. Whereas golf, it's, it's, it's proactive. I've got all this time to think. And which, which makes it harder because that lets in, you know, you can get the worms in your head and start talking to you. And the other thing about it that makes it difficult is with given that time to think is the human brain is wired, hardwired to find problems. I mean, to survive 100,000 years ago or a million years ago, whatever it was, you had to be able to pay attention to the idea that that sound shouldn't be there or, you know, that, that area in the water around the water hole doesn't look the way it should or doesn't look the way it used to. If you couldn't identify those problems, you know, you exited the gene pool. But now we have a brain that's really hardwired. It's much easier. Like when I used to consult, if I went into an organization with a flip with two flip charts and I said, okay, guys, tell me everything that's wrong with your company right now. I'd fill up that flip chart. And if I said, tell me everything that's right, it would be a lot harder to get a few items on the board. It's just the way we're wired. So it's, I don't think it's a matter of blaming yourself for not having a, a super positive attitude, but I think it's recognizing that, you know, the nature of the game and the nature of the, of the, of the brain is going to mitigate against me being out there just relaxing and having fun. I mean, we really should, I mean, this is my opinion, but we should be playing golf the way you'd throw a, a ball to your dog in the backyard. You know, you look at the target, you throw the ball. If you miss the dog, well, you go and pick up the ball again, you throw it again. And paradoxically, the more you can do that, if you think about it, the more you're completely relaxed, carefree, just looking at a target and letting it go, guess what's going to happen? You're going to make more good shots. Tension's a, sw- a killer. So, you made the, you know, sorry. Sorry, you know, you go ahead. Yeah, please. well, I was going to say, I think you made the point, um, and I can't recall whether it was when we were chatting earlier or, or if it was in the book, but that, that you can't think your way out of an emotional reaction. Um, no, you if, can't. You know, if, if you're angry, you can't just sort of apply logic to it and, and say, stop being angry. It's mm-hmm. not possible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's where, you know, I think one of the things that Ray says in the book is it takes feelings to change feelings. So it's really helpful. I think one of the most helpful things you can do for your golf game 
is recognize it's physical, mental, and emotional. Three equal dimensions. Because what most guys do, I think, is they, is they consider the, the emotional part of the game just a subset of the, of the mental game. But if you think about, if you put the emotional first, in other words, if you get your heart in the right place, then, um, then you got a really good chance to get your head and your hands in sync. Like in my case, I, I think there's, there's no doubt for me that, that developing a better attitude helped me help me learn to play better or play closer to my quote unquote potential. If that's, if that means it. And it's not new. I mean, I, I was reading this book. This is a book I'd highly recommend to everybody that you're all your viewers. It's called the elements of scoring. And it's by a game guy by the name of Raymond Floyd who knows a bit about it or knew a bit about it. This was written 20 years ago. And he says, in my opinion, attitude, attitude is the most underrated word in golf. A good one is essential to enjoyment, to improvement, and of course, to being a scorer. It takes time, but once you fully grasp and appreciate how valuable a good attitude is, the incentive to keep going is considerable. I mean, so it's not new, not a new idea, but I think it's been kind of buried under this whole mechanical, mental PGA Tour stuff. And again, like if you think about the PGA Tour visualization, so let's say, um, let's say I'm 190 yards out, which for me is a five hybrid, let's say, right? So I'm 190 yards out and I want to be, you know, I, I want to follow the mental program that uh, my favorite PGA guy does, you know, that Jack Nicholas wrote about years ago, the whole mental movie thing. So I get in the think box. I don't know if you heard that term, but you know, I get in my think box and I, I see my target and I see my ball, you know, this beautiful high five hybrid, you know, arcing towards the, the, the pin with a slight fade. I see it landing, you know, 20 feet from the pin. I see it rolling towards the pin. I see that all in my mind's eye, right? Good stuff. Now what's the chances of me pulling that off on a scale of, uh, of and 10, 10 shots? Um, two or three out of 10. That's, that's being very gracious. And, and I'm a low single digit player from 190 yards. If I get the thing on the green three times out of 10, I'm doing pretty well. So what I'm doing by creating this visualization is that at a, at a subconscious level, I'm setting an expectation in my mind. And when I don't meet that expectation time and time and time again, what does that lead to? Frustration with the game. I mean, that isn't the, now again, I'm not saying this is not the way to go for the pros. I mean, bang on. If you've got the talent, go for it. Because the pro is going is, is, is gonna to pull that shot off six, seven, eight times out of ten. But I'm not. And I don't play, and I play with some good golfers at my club, and none of them are either. So it, wouldn't it be better for me to pick my target visually, align myself to the target, have zero expectation of where this thing is going to go, and just make a relaxed, smooth pass at the ball. And then if it happens to, to get on the green, go, whoa, you know, like, how cool is that? Good shot to myself. We should be allowing ourselves to have Ryder Cup reactions as opposed to being like a, you know, stoic philosopher, if I hit a great shot, why not have a little smile? Why not have a little, yeah, whoo. Why not have a little, whoo, how cool is that? In the I mean, would your, buddies rather, would your buddies rather listen to you do that or rather listen to you moan and groan for four hours? In, in the book, one of the aspects of Ray's character is that I, I guess there's a, a lot of self-talk um, mm. after he makes a shot. And um, yep. without, I don't want to spoil things, but it's, it's positive self-talk. Yeah. It's not negative. And, and uh, he's, uh, he uses that uh, you know, as part of his attitude to the whole game. It's not just a, a post-shot reaction. It's a 
it's almost part of his plan for how he's mm -hmm. going to approach the whole round. Um, well, that's why we're there. I mean, it costs me, you know, thousands of dollars to play golf every year. I mean, I'm, I'm, at, a, I'm at a club a year or two, but if I was paying for a round, I'd be dropping, you know, 60, 80, 100 bucks. Why am I there? Am I there to post a score? Well, nobody cares about it. And even if I happen to shoot the best score in my life, it's, it's not going to make the golf channel and they're still going to ask me to pay tomorrow. So why am I there? I'm there to experience how good it feels to hit one on the screws. Why not enjoy it? Exactly. So yeah. do, does the, this emotional approach that this, you know, kind of changing your attitude, does it have other applications that you found? To, I mean, as a leadership coach and performance coach, did, did that, come into play at that time? Is it something that, that you used uh, in, in other aspects of, of your life uh, apart from golf? Yeah, a lot of, a, a lot of leadership is uh, managing expectations or, or, or being able to create uh, the terminology as resonance. So what, what happens in leadership is that people believe more of what you're resonating with than they do the words that you say. So one of the things that, you know, without getting into a song and dance about it, one of the things that I would do when I'd be coaching executives and make sure that they got themselves into a state of mind where they were in a positive vibe, so to speak, because when an executive is having a conversation with one of his direct reports, the direct report picks up that feeling more than um, more than listens to the words that are said. I mean, there's an interesting, uh, you know, for anybody who really wants to go down the rabbit hole, there's an interesting group called HeartMath. And they, uh, they've done a lot of research in the last 10, 15 years. And, and they talk about the, the impact of attitude and emotions on your performance so that people will, people will pick up as much on what you, on how you say something as they will on what you say. And, and how you say is determined by what you're feeling in any given moment. So anyway, yeah, I would, I would do a lot of that kind of work with, uh, with the execs that I uh, worked with. Very cool. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that uh, Ray, I guess, teaches Bob in the book is um, about how to change his emotions. And there's an interesting aspect to how you do that. Do you want to just talk about that a little bit? Yeah, well, the, uh, the idea is that you, what Ray reveals is, is there's something that you do takes two or three minutes before the round. And there's something that you do after the round takes five to 10 minutes maximum. But you don't actually do anything during the round. Because if you think about it, when you're playing when you're just absorbed in the game and, and, and you know, you're, you're, you're playing well and you're really enjoying it, you're not thinking about anything. It just seems to kind of happen. I mean, it's almost like there's no thoughts going on. So the last thing you want to do during a round is, Oh, geez, I got to remember. Now I got to remember I'm supposed to say this after a shot. Or now I've got to remember that I've got to do this or think that you, you don't want to do any of that. If you're trying to change your emotions, it's almost like you're, you're, you're cultivating an, an emotional state as opposed to try to control it. And you cultivate that before and after the round and during the round, just play. And if you do this, I'm going to say, if you do this for, you know, seven, eight, nine rounds, you'll start to notice a shift. Yeah. You'll start to notice a shift. Well, I, I'm looking forward to, uh, uh, putting some of that into practice uh, this round, I'm, I'm hoping to get out for what, what's only going to be my second round of the year, but um, there, there's lots of food for that there. And um, I, I guess my, my, my next question really is, is how is the, what's the reaction been to the book? I mean, it, it's well, obviously yeah. different. It, it, you know, I don't want to say it breaks the mold, but uh, it, it certainly, um, is off on a tangent a little bit from what the uh, mainstream thinking is about 
you know, mental and physical, and now we've added in mm -hmm. this third dimension. So, um, you know, what, what, how have people perceived the book and, and what's been the reaction to it? Well, uh, I appreciate you saying that it's not, uh, it's not in the mainstream. That's, that's great. Um, now the, the, the reaction has been very good. I, I would say, um, good to great so far. It's been, it's been out for, uh, maybe four or five weeks. It's only available online online. And, uh, you know, I've had some guys come back to me and say that it's, uh, you know, changed their games and, uh, you know, thanks very much. And, uh, but it, yeah, it's been, it's been very, very positive. It's, it's kind of a thing where, you know, it, it, it will work if you work it, you know, if you put the tiny bit of effort that two or three minutes before around five, 10 minutes after around, if you put some, a little bit of effort into doing what Ray recommends, um, it will begin to make a shift and, you know, to be, to be relaxed, to be carefree, to be just target focused and enjoying your best shots. I mean, Hey, that's why we're there. So you've obviously had some time uh, to think about this and, and as, as you're developing the concept and writing the book, uh, uh, would you say that you're now a, a black belt in, in uh, Ray's way of thinking and has it, had a, <laughs> has it had an improvement in, in your golf game? Yeah, it, it's, it's definitely helped my game. There's no doubt about that. Um, I, I don't know uh, whether I'm a black belt, but yesterday I was playing with a couple of, with three, three guys, uh, our teaching pro at the club and two, two other guys. And I hit a shot on the, on the, on the eighth hole that was a particularly good one. And I let out a little, you know, like, all right, or something like that. And uh, one of the guys said, one of the guys said, I've never seen anybody, you know, congratulate himself for a good shot as much as you do. And uh, the other, his other buddy said, well, that's his thing, man. You know, like enjoy the good ones and forget about the bad ones. So I don't know. I mean, uh, I, I still get, I still get, if I'm in a, a important tournament, quote unquote, I'll still get afraid. I'll still get a little pissed off if I hit a bad shot, but I would say it's more um, like a little pebble in a pond now, whereas, you know, seven, eight years ago, it was a, you know, a meteor into the ocean kind of thing and a big tsunami. So, but it's, Very it's, cool. it, it's, it's good. It's good stuff. Good. Well, Thanks for joining me today on the Fairway Show. The name of the book is Play Like Ray. You can, uh, there, there's a description or, or a link below actually the video to uh, let you know how to uh, uh, get the book online. And uh, thanks again, Ray. It's, or, or Ray. Thanks again. Uh, yeah, you, you could be Ray now, actually. Yeah, there you thanks go. Yeah. yeah. Thanks again, Kent, for joining me today. Well, thank you very much, Peter. I really appreciate it. Okay. Have Take a great care. round tomorrow. Thank you. Bye now. Yeah. Bye-bye.